Hello! Welcome to the Coach House Podcast, episode four. On this show, we have Suzette Meyer, author of the Giller Prize long-listed The Sleeping Car Porter, answers our stupid author question. Like, what am I supposed to say? Yes, maybe you have read it. It's called Game of Thrones. Like, I don't know what they... I don't know. I don't know what they're saying. Bookseller Rupert McNally gives us his latest pick. The scope of this book is actually pretty impressive in that he talks about essentially what was going on in the whole country. And Lisa Robertson and Derek McCormick contemplate the intersection between fashion and revolution. Well, Um, Derek, I think that as for as long as there is... uh, bodily shame in the world, there will be um, luscious perversion. <laughs> I, I should what be, else are we going to do with our shame? I should be lobbying against shame, but I'm, I hear I'm all for it. I'm pro-shame. Most authors love to be interviewed, but all of them have that one question they dread. This week we asked Suzette Meyer, author of The Sleeping Car Porter, which has just been put on the Giller Prize long list, what question she hates to be asked. Hi, my name is Suzette Meyer, and I'm the author of five novels, and my forthcoming book is The Sleeping Car Porter. Suzette, what is the most annoying question you get asked as an author? The most annoying question I get as an author is, have you written anything I might have read? I don't understand it. I don't understand what that question is. I try to, you know, take all these questions in the most generous way possible. So I totally understand when somebody says, you know, what time of day do you write? Or do you use a pencil or a pen? I'm totally into that. But this question, I don't know what they're actually asking because, you know, are they expecting me to be psychic or I don't know what's going on. I just don't. Where do you get asked this question? It's usually like at social events that have nothing to do with writing. You know, so I'm at a dinner party or back when there were dinner parties that I attended regularly or, you know, just, you know, the dog park or whatever. Whenever there's some sort of casual conversation with a stranger, I get this question. I've also had it, you know, when you're chatting with people on the bus about the weather and then it comes up. So I try not to ever mention that I'm a writer at all because I just can't cope. I cannot handle those questions. (laughs) I can't do it. What do you think they're trying to get at when they ask you that question? I, I wonder if it's something about, you know, I don't know, the New York Times bestseller list or something like that. Like, what am I supposed to say? Yes, maybe you have read it. It's called Game of Thrones. Like, I don't know what they, I don't know. I don't know what they're saying. Um, You know, I've also had people ask me, so I say, yeah, I'm a writer. And I say this very reluctantly. And they say, so what kind of book do you write? And it's like, I have no idea. I can't, I can never answer that. And I think what they're actually asking, you know, is... uh, I think the the correct answer, the answer that seems to get the the nods is when I say I write literary fiction. I don't know. I, I talked to one woman on the bus once and she said that she's read all 12 books. And I'm like, which 12 books? Which... <laughs> <laughs> like in existence or the, yeah, the, 12, think, yeah. the 12 books you may not have written? <laughs> yeah. She wasn't talking about my work at all. She was talking about the, the 12 books. I'm like, okay, sure. Maybe she thought you were an- another writer or something? I... I don't know. I don't know. Or I th- I suspect she was probably talking about some sort of self-help series. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. What? Oh, I'm going to ask you this annoying question, though. The, what kind of books do you write? Like, what, what, what answer do you want to give? Or how do you think of that question for yourself? <laughs> like, here we are. Like, I know it's an annoying question. I'm annoying you right now. <laughs> But do you ever like, do you do you ever think about your books? Maybe I'm just asking you a style question now. Like in your own head, do you have a private answer for this? I always think of my book. So I kind of came of age as a writer when magic realism was a big thing. So, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Robert Croach, Isabel Allende. And I had also, you know, I'm, I've been hugely influenced by writers like Gertrude Stein and Virginia Woolf. So I think it's kind of a fusion of, you know, that kind of more 
experimental in quotation marks because you know it's a hundred years ago so how experimental or avant-garde is it really you know that kind of experimental um resistance to the sentence as a unit um and wanting to kind of break apart the sentence but at the same time i'm very much in love with magic realism i'm in love with the supernatural you know so it's sort of i i don't know a kind of marriage of those two so what is that i don't know what that is i mean i've heard people say oh slipstream or you know but it's the labels change all the time i really don't know i really don't know what's going on and of course you can't just say that to someone when they Mm -hmm. ask that question they're not interested (laughs) they must these can't be right in full disclosure um i'm a poet and whenever people ask me this like i it's cringy for me right like i don't want to <laughs> i don't even want to say i'm a poet let alone have to describe no that's oh poets have it poets have it way worse way worse i can only imagine the questions they ask you i'm not even embarrassed of being a poet it's like i just it I, I can talk about my own work, but when like placed under that circumstance, right? Would just like tell me like what do you write? I say I I would rather not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Have you ever have you ever had that? Someone ever asked you to to read your work like impromptu? No, they so don't care. Usually the next question. So you know, have you written anything I might have read? After that is well, I have a novel too. I've been thinking of writing a novel. I've had such amazing experiences and. So then they want to talk about themselves, usually in that circumstance. They're, they don't care. They don't care what I've written. I'm okay with that, but don't ask me that question. <laughs> Your upcoming book for Coach House, uh, The Sleeping Car Porter, mm-hmm. um, is about a Black queer sleeping car porter uh, mm-hmm. on a train going through Canada. How do you think you're going to describe this book if you get asked? I think I'll just say it's a historical fiction about a sleeping car porter. You know, there was a time in Canadian history when, you know, luxury passenger trains uh, were staffed only by black men. And so um, it revolves around that character. And there's a little bit of magic thrown in, you know, a little bit of haunting in there as well. So it will just confuse people even more. (laughs) It's a historical fiction for sure, but it's also about a uh, queer history that I think is mostly lost. It's also about, you know, it's kind of dreamy because the porter um, isn't able to get any sleep. And so he's got insomnia and um, he's literally also not allowed to sleep for very long uh, every day. And so he has hallucinations. So it's quite hallucinatory in places. So I don't know what kind of book that is. And so, you know, what I'm hoping is that sometimes... You know, as he's trying to figure out what's real and what's hallucination, I'm hoping that the reader also sometimes isn't always entirely sure what's real and what's hallucination or dream even. Suzette Meyer, thank you for joining us for Annoying Author Questions. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) If you want to read a good book, Ask someone who stands in a store surrounded by them all day long. For this week's bookseller pick, we asked Rupert McNally from McNally Books to tell us what he's excited about. Hi, Rupert. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Who are you? Thanks for having me, James. Uh, My name is Rupert McNally. I am a bookseller, the manager now of uh, Ben McNally Books over on King Street. And I first started working uh, in books when I was about 16 years old and my father wrote me in to work in weekends at Nicholas Hoare. And I've been doing that to varying degrees of success ever since. And what book would you like to talk about today? The book that I've read recently that really blew me away is a book called We Don't Know Ourselves by Fintan O'Toole, which is a liveright book, which is a um, subsidiary of Norton. And it's, uh, the subtitle is A Personal History of Modern Ireland. Okay, and why, why are you recommending this book? Uh, I thought the writing was superb, first and foremost. But the other thing that I sort of overlooked when reading this book was the huge transformation that Ireland underwent in the past, say, 40 and 50 years. Um, it is now a pretty successful country, uh, at least a, a pretty progressive one and a decently transparent one. And I didn't realize that that certainly wasn't the case as late as, say, 
the late 90s. And what was the catalyst? What was the changing moment then that took Ireland 40 years into the future where it is now? I think a huge part of it was the sort of ceasing of hostilities in the late 90s between the um, IRA and um, the, uh, I guess, British government. Um, I think that was a huge awakening for just about everyone involved. Um, And consequently, I think there was a lot of change in politics and a lot of change in culture. I I think that sort of hope was pervasive in the country, whereas before they were sort of resigned to ongoing cycles of violence. Can you talk about the writing in the book for a second, Rupert? Like there are a lot of uh, political, personal, historical uh, books out at the moment, but what was it about the writing of this book that grabbed you? I think a part of it was how close Vincent O'Toole was to a lot of what he was writing about. He's been a journalist for um, ages, um, based in Ireland. And so he knew a lot of the politicians that he wrote about. Um, and so you get a sort of level of insight into them as people that I don't know you would be afforded from a, a pretty sort of distant or dispassionate um, history. The other thing I thought was that while he says it's a personal history, the scope of this book is actually pretty impressive in that he talks about um you know, where he grew up, but he also talks about essentially what was going on in the whole country from one coast to the other. And Rupert, what kind of reader would you imagine would be the best fit for this book? Well, I remember the huge success of a book called Say Nothing, and I don't know that it has the same sort of triggers as that book, but I think anyone interested in history will be interested in this. Um, but I think it's a bit more accessible than a lot of other history books because of that personal element, because of that sort of intimacy or that closeness of the writing. Rupert, thank you for joining us on the Coach House podcast. Thank you so much for having me, James. This past May, for the publication of her latest poetry collection, Boat, we had the pleasure of hosting Lisa Robertson for a reading and conversation with good friend of the press, Derek McCormick. The talk went so well, we asked them to chat again for the podcast about fashion, writing, and culture. Welcome to the Coach House Podcast. Uh, Hey, Derek, you're ready to go. Who are you? Uh, I am an author. Uh, my most recent novel is called Castle Faggot, and my most recent book is Judy Blames Obituary, which is a collection of um, essays and articles I wrote over the last 120 years. <laughs> and Lisa, who are you? Uh, Lisa Robertson, have a new book called Boat, um, a long collection of poems which have been under uh, under construction for at least 20 years and just before boat i had a novel out also with coach house called the baudelaire fractal derek why didn't you kick us off i would love to i'm going to mention a quote i mentioned during our conversation which is from boat it's from the first poem of boat and it says to speak philosophy and still be the fashion blogs which really grabbed me um is it possible to speak philosophy and still be a fashion blog. This is an ideal state that I'm talking about, the desire for the fashion blogs to speak philosophy, Mm -hmm. still be the fashion blogs. Um, Perhaps in the uh, fallen world we exist in, uh, it might be a bit of a stretch, but my um, strong belief about philosophy, and I do think that poetry and philosophy are more or less interchangeable as is uh, novel writing and essay. I have no boundaries actually between these things. Um, they have to, all of them include the experience of the body. And uh, my big problem with philosophy, which I am by the way, very passionate about as an amateur reader, 
is um, the exclusion of bodily experience from that discourse. So, um, and along with bodily experience, I mean the decoration of the body, the um, the the pleasure of the body, um, the um, dare I say falsity of the body. So I want all of those things to be part of a text and part of a reading experience. And um, and I also just have a pure nostalgia for the great lost era era of blogs. Mm, tell me about what years would you say that is? When were you reading? When were blogs preeminent for you? I would say um, early to mid 2000s. Okay. I, I think I pro, you know, when I was, when I started reading um, like Susie Bubble, the Sartorialist, um, I was reading knitting blogs, the fabulous West Coast poet Peter Culley, now deceased, had a great blog called Mosses from an Old Manse, which was not a fashion blog, but I, I read it in the era of fashion blogs as if it were also a fashion blog. Um, yeah, that's, um, that's when I was really aware of them. Um, that was just before social media, right? Right. And I think that um, the rise of uh, first Facebook, then Instagram, you know, whenever that happened, I don't know, like, I, I became aware of that stuff, not as a participant, but as a, you know, eavesdropper, I don't know, around 2006, 2007, 2008. And I think they really have brought down the blogs. I mean, thankfully, there are some um, diehards who um, keep doing, um, who keep blogging. Right. Right. So what we're talking about is the loss of words suddenly. Well, a particular word image relationship that right. is partly diaristic in its feeling it, right. it's or or like more essayistic in the montagna sense you know somebody tracking their personal impressions in in real time right um i i'm particularly fond first of all i like that you mentioned that uh, peter's blog wasn't a fashion blog but you read it as a fashion blog because i i think everything i read is i read as a fashion blog um or at least to extract things uh, that I can use as yeah. ornament or embroidery in my own work. Um, and two, I'm, I, you know, I, I, I love images, but for me, fashion is writing first. I love labels and clothes. I love care labels. I love bags. I love, the only thing I don't like are the uh, press releases that designers send out. I mean, and sometimes I remember getting a Balenciaga one. It was a 500 page book with three images total in it. And I thought, I recycled it and thought, okay, 10,000 more people need to recycle this right now. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I never read blogs. I have to say, I, I, I read a few blogs, but I was really addicted to um, maybe even an earlier era, which is the magazine. Like I remember Bill Cunningham oh. writing in details. And I mean, that stuff is imprinted forever in my mind and there's no replacement for it now. Ooh. Absolutely, absolutely. I had a fabulous job in Vancouver for the part-time job I did for a couple of years when I was finishing writing my book, Debbie and Epic, and mm. starting writing The Weather, um, which is, I was, a I, I was a cashier in a magazine store. And it was, a, it was like a really good magazine store that had all the European um, architecture magazines, fashion magazines, all of that. And um, you know this because we're both booksellers, um, you do returns on magazines by simply ripping off the front cover and sending the front cover back to the yeah. distributor um, for um, um, credit. At least the, the shop does, which means those of us who work in the magazine stores take home all magazines, although contracts have been sign saying that we will not do it <laughs> so yeah bringing home italian vogue in the mid 90s was um such a joy not least typographically i mean right. these were um these were such sophisticated artifacts of page design in a way that i i don't think that the um internet-based publication will ever achieve no no and i i should say there are lots of 
really beautiful magazines and fashion magazines out now. I can't personally afford them. We don't get them at my bookstore. And I can't imagine paying full price for a book or a magazine. Um, and especially if a magazine is $92, you know, oh, which a lot of them are because they're so niche right now. They've become sort of trade, um, trade regs. Yeah. 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 Um, I also love that you said you were, um, you're an amateur philo reader of philosopher. I'm an amateur wearer of clothes, an amateur writer of words. I'm an amateur everything. So I appreciate yeah. you saying that. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, we're the, the sort of passionately self-taught Maybe. Yes. Yourself untaught. <laughs> well, it's and funny. I, oh. oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt. I, I did have a question. I just yeah. got to get in here before we run out of time. As an outsider to fashion blogs and stuff like that, like, in hearing you right now, Derek, say you're an, you feel like an amateur and Lisa, you're an amateur you know, reader of philosophy. It seems that like when, when fashion magazines are now $92, mm -hmm we've lost anything amateur about it. And the, mm -hmm. the, the few bits of fashion writing, photography and blogging I know is from street fashion, right? Just like people out and about and people like Bill Cunningham or whatever, yeah. just take their picture. Is there a loss of that now? And I guess what my question is, do you see a change on actual fashion? Like when the, the real fashionistas, the people who are paying attention, who are buying these clothes, they're now either having to pay $92 or lose the sort of availability of blogs to really get the text. Do you see a change in, or this is affecting fashion? Oh. It's for both of you. Well, the, the cheap magazines still exist. There's still such a thing as Vogue magazine, um, which is, you know, I don't know how much it costs. I don't, I don't buy them anymore, but, um, you know, they are out there. And I mean, some of it really, really great uh, fashion writers have written for The New Yorker. Like I'm thinking Judith Thurman, for example. Mm -hmm. I think she's a really wonderful fashion writer. Um, but as for how you, you're asking, like how clothes themselves have changed? Or maybe just people themselves. Like if, if young people don't have access as much to say the text, like we were talking about social media has really taken away a lot of the text, the writing about fashion as well. Does that change the way people then interact with fashion, the way they think about it? I'm wondering if you, you two both have more of a, uh, attention towards this. So I was wondering if you've noticed any changes in the way people approach fashion with social media sort of taking over uh, what used to be blogging. Well, I think the biggest, I'm gonna sound like a grumpy old man when I say this, which I am. Um, I would say there's uh, some professionalized effect happening in fashion where when I was younger, uh, there was something still subcultural about fashion there's something faggy about it. There was also something when you bought a designer, it marked you as part of a group or a crowd. Uh, if you, and I remember that up till even, you know, going to the first Rick Owens store in New York and the staff were clearly like, it was some sophisticated evolution from the Batcave in London. And at some point fashion became mainstream in the way that some sports are and pop music and, and, you find young people, straight, gay, everywhere around the world being brand obsessed. Um, I'm not saying all people are, but I'm saying if you look at social media, the amplification of brands and the way money can get images across and get people desiring is, I, I think, a much huger scale than when I was young. I think when I was young, you knew that you know the Blooming, Bl Betsy Bloomingdale went to Yves Saint Laurent and got clothes. But now what shocks me is, um, how young professional people spend so much money on clothes and clothes are so expensive and the reach of it is so deep. Um, and it's lost some of that, for me, it's lost some of the subcultural thrill of um, being part of a scene, you know, or imagining you're part of a scene. The fantasy, even the way you can construct a fashion fantasy has changed, I think. But let me say, Derek, you have constructed a fashion fantasy in Judy Blame's obituary. So maybe some of that uh, gorgeous sort of secretive opacity and, and um, deep decor that you're referring to in the fashion world still exists in the uh, indie press movement. Oh, I'm so grateful for you saying that. Cause I, I do- I want to think it does. I, I really do think that book is like a, an account of me um, loving and perverting what I love about fashion. And it, 
And I'm sure there are still kids out there and people who I hope are perverting, you know, perverting those brands and perverting uh, the runways and perverting what they see in stores and making it their own, uh, customizing it. Well, um, Derek, I think that as for as long as there is uh, bodily shame in the world, there will be um, luscious perversion. <laughs> I, I should what else be, are we going to do with our shame? I should be lobbying against shame, but I'm I hear I'm all for it. I'm pro shame if that's what it does. And I'm saying that as someone who's been shamed and shamed themselves their whole life. So I'm in deep. I'm invested in this shame. I've been uh, rereading some parts of Rousseau's confessions this morning for a different project. And basically he says that his entire project of writing the confessions um, is, is, um, was caused by a deep experience of shame he had as a teenager when he stole a pink and silver piece of ribbon oh. and blamed it on the housemaid. Wow. That's ruining her career. Yeah. So wow. he stole it. It was found among his possessions, this piece of ribbon pink and silver, he specifies. He denied that he stole it. He said the housemaid stole it and gave it to him, whereas he had stolen it um, in order to give to her. And so he flipped it. But he said the shame he experienced in feeling that in, 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 in um, revisiting um, this, this twisted narrative for the rest of his life basically caused all of his literary work to um to arrive wow so I, I think there's something really core about shame and writing and uh the glittery bit of ribbon <laughs> i mean it reminds me of how much how in my book I, I mentioned that one of the thrills for me of fashion is that it obliterates the person you know that um that there that that putting on the clothes wipes out the identity. And I think that of course happens with everyone with labels, but I think what, what you mentioned is what's important to me and that's enjoying it. That somehow enjoying the dissolution of yourself at mm -hmm. the hands of fashion, which is of course a contradiction or a very quick process as quick as thought or something. But uh, that ribbon story reminds me of that. It basically ruined people in a moment. Now one recovered. The woman did not recover probably as so easily, which is a telling, of course. Mm -hmm. But the ribbon, that's a mean motherfucking piece of ribbon. Aren't you just dying to see the ribbon? Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like finding some pink and silver ribbon and telling people this is Rousseau's ribbon. I have it. So, so like the, the entire history of confessional literature since Rousseau is basically a, an ornate box for that little... <laughs> scrap of now decomposed ribbons sort of like you know christ's finger or something oh it's genius it's genius i'm going on ebay right after this <laughs> guys that's the perfect place to wrap it up right there that's absolutely perfect thank you both I'm gonna thank stop. you so much that was really really great thank you lisa you're welcome okay i turn my thing off you can turn your thing off yeah Thank you for listening. Thanks for everyone who appeared on this show. Andrew Kaufman is always the best. Now go on out there, enjoy the last of the summer. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's it. Yep, it's good. Awesome.